Let your work speak for itself. And then it come to you. I didn't get it first, but I got it now. It took a while. I've been looked over. I've had disappointing moments. We're not ready for a black woman to do this now. How do you overcome all of that? And I've had just good advice from my husband and a couple of others. Just dusting off all the shade and just keep forging ahead, being comfortable in your own shoes. Let's be my rants and gems. Be my rants and gems. gems. Y'all can do what we discover. Uh, He's the uh, kings uh, and the queens were the mother lie. Today's episode is brought to you by our partners at Zillow. Big shout out to everybody at the Zillow team. Ty, everybody over there. Thank you. We appreciate the support. But guys, have you ever caught yourself browsing Zillow at 3 a.m.? Same. It's too easy. You know what else is easy? Getting a new home from Zillow. With Zillow, you can take a closer look at homes that's been on the market with thousands of listings that have virtual tours, interactive floor plans, compare your favorite home side by side to see which one has the features that you want. You can request a tour with a local agent to get on the ground insights about neighborhoods you like or learn about financing options and connect with the local lender to apply for pre-qualification. Right. A lot of people don't even know that Zillow does mortgages, too. So you can check Zillow out for mortgages as well. So when you when you find a home that you love, you'll be ready. So make sure you guys download the Zillow app today to get your next place. Go to Zillow dot com right now and download it. All right. We'll have the link in the description of this video as well. Again, thank you for Zillow for sponsoring today's episode. Now, let's get back to today's show. Welcome back to another episode of Rants and Gems Real Estate Podcast. My name is Matt Garland, NMLS number 58700, but better known as MG the Mortgage Guy. Kiana Watson, she tried to catch a flight. It got caught up because of weather, so she couldn't make it. But we got an amazing show today. You guys going to love this. McKissick & McKissick is the oldest minority and woman-owned professional design and construction firm in the nation. I am here with a special guest, Cheryl McKissick. How are you today? I am doing great. It's so nice to be here with you. I've heard so much about InvestFest and, you know, I wish I could have been in Atlanta, but hope that we're going to collaborate as we go forward. Oh, absolutely. That's what we have to we do. We definitely need you at InvestFest <laughs> next year. That's for sure. Because InvestFest, I mean, Craig and Don, they did a great job holding the fort down. But I know if you was there, it, you would have just rocked the audience. You know, we, <laughs> oh, had, over four, you. we had over 14,000 people there at InvestFest. Mm -hmm. And we definitely needed your energy there, too. So hopefully we can have you this year in August when we only have over 20,000 people. Oh, my goodness. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. I appreciate you so much for doing this for our community. No problem. And the ownership is where it's at. So absolutely. Absolutely. This is great. And you're, like I said, the definition of generational wealth. For our audience, can you tell them a little bit about who you are and your family's history? Absolutely. I'm Cheryl McKissick Daniel, president and CEO of McKissick & McKissick. As you said, the nation's oldest black-owned design and construction mm. firm. Talk it. I love it already. <laughs> Let me get comfortable here. <laughs> We go back five generations. The first descendant of our family came here as a slave in 1790 and taught the trade of making bricks. And um, we believe at some point he became free. Mm. He was Moses McKissick I. And you can only imagine what that was like in 1790. Um his son was Moses McKissick II. He was a master carpenter, which means basically these men would design their own buildings and build them. Um, and so that was an actual trade. He was known for spiral staircases and gingerbread finishes on Southern homes. So most notably, wow. he built the Maxwell House Hotel, which is in downtown Nashville. Mm. And Five of our U.S. presidents have stayed in this hotel. That's incredible. And so he was Moses McKissick II. Believe it or not, he and his wife had seven girls and then seven boys. Wow, they were busy. <laughs> they were busy. <laughs> they were definitely busy. 14. So my grandfather was their first son. Uh -huh. And because they wanted sons all the, you know, the seven times they had the girls, he had like seven names. Like his name was Moses Edward John Henry Lewis McKissick. The third. <laughs> mm. um, he and his brother became the first black licensed architects in America with license 117 and 118. Wow. But what's interesting about their story 
is they incorporated our business in 1905, and that was before there were architectural license. Uh, architectural license didn't go into effect until 1920 in, in Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. Um, so here they are in business for, you know, 15 years. A new law comes into play. And if they don't get licensed, they're put out of business. So can you imagine two black men in the 1920s in the deep prejudice South? The deep prejudice South. Deep prejudice South going to take their license. Can you imagine the challenges that they went through? <laughs> they were told no over and over and over again, but they persevered and they found one of the board members that they could uh, lobby, so to speak. And he said, you know, to the rest of the board, at least let them take the exam. They're not going to pass. <laughs> and they wound up passing. And they passed. <laughs> <laughs> so they had and no choice they, now. But then they didn't want to give them their license. Really? They still tried to block them. We're going to have to do a movie on that. <laughs> but Definitely. They, <laughs> they finally uh, got their license and be became the first black license in America. Now, because of that, the same board that didn't want them to get their license gained notoriety across the, the, the states. And they went to bat for them to get their license in 22 other states. Because now it was like the amazing thing that two black men uh, were licensed. So these these gentlemen were pioneers in their field, obviously. Mm. Um, and, you know, they worked in Africa and in uh, Haiti with Papa Doc. They wow. were all over. Uh, they built about 6,000 structures. Wow. They did a lot of work for the black church. So they would build um, churches at cost and, and not charge. Um, and so a lot of times when I'm here in New York and, you know, we win a big project, I think about my grandparents and their tithing mm. to the black community and how I'm reaping the benefits of that. Uh, the company then was passed down to my um, father, who was uh, the fourth generation, William McKissick. He was an architect, contractor as well. And then to my mother, who became the first female to run our business. Um, my mother had been a school teacher. She didn't even know the name or the telephone number of the company. Really? When my father had a stroke and she had to step in and take over. Wow. She's a fortune nature. She's a dynamo. And she said, I'm saving this company for my daughters. And she took over with no experience. She had a master's degree in psychology. And I like to say because of that, she could understand the phobias people had around a black woman running a business in the 1980s. In the 1980s, women could not get loans. White women could not get loans from banks. Just women in Only general. Only men. Not even white women. Yeah. Damn. Um, it wasn't until 1990 with the Women's Act that came out of the federal government that women were even able, business act, were able to get loans. So your son, your uncle, your husband could get loans, but you couldn't. Yeah. Um, and so my mother was able to, you know, keep the business afloat with not only not being educated in construction or design, but also having those financial constraints. But she was a very good salesperson. You know, she owned her. She owned it. Yeah. <laughs> and so she was able to actually grow our business beyond Nashville, Tennessee, to Alabama and um, Atlanta and, and several uh, cities in the South. Um, but business start changing. You know, people don't keep their word. You know, everything has to have a contract. If, if you don't have a contract, you don't know where you're going to end up at the end of the day. And so all of that got to just be a lot, a bit much for her. And so yeah. health-wise, she started declining. Um, and so she called up my boss, <laughs> working in New York for Turner Construction. She calls up my boss and she says, Cheryl's quitting today. And then she called me and said, I just told your boss you're quitting. Pack up and I want you to report to the Nashville office tomorrow. And I'm like, what? That's cr that's incredible. Yeah, and but I'm pulling that on my daughter right now. <laughs> <laughs> the apple don't fall too far yeah, from the, the tree, huh? Yes. Uh, and, you know. I resented it at the time. I had just gotten married. You know, I didn't want to leave New York. New York is the only place I wanted to have a professional career, but I did it. Um, 
I knew she needed my help. And I went to Nashville. I learned the business. I got to know our clients. And after two years, she allowed me to come back to New York and open a New York McKissick and McKissick, which mm. I did and actually created my own business, uh, the McKissick Group. And then in 1990, she made me buy. <laughs> hear me? Buy. So she didn't, pa- she, she, she didn't pass, pass it down. Pass. She said, we're going to get my, I'm going to get my coins. <laughs> <laughs> Shout exactly. out to moms. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a real businesswoman. Absolutely. You know, you have to have skin in the game. You know this. Absolutely. If you don't have skin in the game, you don't treat it like it's your own. We were just having this conversation, off record before you guys got here. It's okay. easy for people to spend or blow money that they didn't earn. Right. So when you have that skin in the game, you're going to treat it differently. You're going to treat it differently. I have a daughter graduated from George Washington University in organizational science. She should be working on the East Coast. She should be in the business. Uh-huh. Uh, no, she wanted to go to L.A. and chase her dream. And what? Oh, Chan can tell you two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I'm like, I'm not going into 2023 like that. And I thought about what my mother did to me. And I said to her, the only way I'm supporting you is if you live in New York City and And, you're working for my company. you're working for the company. Because I'm at a crossroad too. I need a succession plan. Absolutely. You need your exit strategy. Right. So either you're going to be a part of this or you're not. Mm. This is now. Like this is is (laughs) real time. How's that going for you right now? Oh, I had to hire a therapist. We had to go through therapy. And, mm. you know, she's there. This week, she said, Mom, I'm coming back to New York. I just, I know it's where I should be. I'm coming. I'll be there for the end of December. And now she's going to be sixth generation. She'll be sixth generation. That's incredible. Yes. There's a lot to unpack. It's just this open <laughs> let's, head. let's go. Let's so, go. Let's, let's unpack. Talk. So this is generational wealth, right? Because there was so <laughs> much that you said here. And, and I'm sure that your family has, uh, like, ironclad estate planning. Right. Because you can't pass down businesses and businesses like this if you don't have estate planning. Like, talk to us about that. Like, how is that working for you guys? Like, how do you really because a lot of our our audience is entrepreneurs, first time entrepreneurs, first time business owners. And, you know, everybody have children for the most part. Like, how do we really set up our businesses so that way we can have generational wealth in our family and, and, you know, fourth and fifth generation people taking over our companies? How do we do that? Great question, because this is something I've been focused on for the last four years. So, you know, when you're building a business, you're, you're just doing whatever you can to bring revenue into the company and then, you know, execute. Mm-hmm. And it takes a while to get that running smoothly. Absolutely. Because you have to depend on other people, depending on how big your business is. You definitely have to depend on the environment and what's happening around you. So you're, you're not in control of a lot of it. So, you know, building a business is not a a get rich quick kind of scenario. It is something that you build on and you, you know, grow in stages by levels. And, you know, it takes time. But a lot of times our businesses or any business, we get distracted in the growth and we get distracted in just running the day to day that we forget succession is coming, whether you plan for it or not. Absolutely. One way or another. You're going to exit that business. Absolutely. So um, when I think about succession, I look at it from the standpoint of a management team or a management group. How is the company going to manage itself without me? And then there's the ownership side. They're two separate things. Okay. Right. I could have two kids that don't want to be in the business and that may happen. Um, That doesn't mean they can't own the business. That's a fact. Right. So, but the management team, they're not a part of. And so for me, when I think about succession, I think about building an outstanding management team that can operate without me, going from the entrepreneurial stage to more of a sustainable stage where it's not, you're not a one arm paper hanger. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> a one arm paper hanger. I like that. <laughs> it's, instead, you have a team of people that understand the culture, that understand, you know, where the company is going. They see the potential and, you know, give them some skin in the game. Absolutely. And, you know, quite frankly, I have looked at this trying to figure out where to get these people. How does that work? And, you know, several times I used headhunters and brought people in from outside. That never works. Mm. Now I have a team of people that have been with me 
at least 10 or 15 years and work their way up through McKissick and McKissick. Um, and after being with the company for 10 or 15 years, you really are committed to the culture of the Absol company. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's their company. It's their company. Yeah. Right. It's, it's their reputation. And, and they know that we're at this point, this crossroad of where we want to do some type of succession. Mm -hmm. So I think the management team is very important. And then when you get to the ownership side, um, I think the management team that's responsible to bring in revenue and execute, they should have some ownership. That was going to be my next question. Like, do you yeah. give them a piece of the company, give them we a little bit of equity or stock? Like, how does that how does that look? Right now, we do it. We're doing it on a, a bonus program. Okay. So your bonus is uh, it's determined on revenue that you bring to the company, or and revenue is one thing, honey. Revenues kill. Profits thrill. <laughs> Revenue, hold on, hold on. Revenues, Revenues kill, kill profits. Profits thrill. Oh, amen. Okay, that's the same amen. way I'm gonna go into. We like that. But <laughs> we gotta clip that one up. <laughs> Don't let me forget that because it's so true. You know, just because the money's coming in, you still have to execute at a certain level, so you have a profit, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. If you're if it Gro takes gross you more and net, to, gross and net, uh -huh. right? So you know, um, it's important that the profits. Are measured. That's a that's a that's a tool that we use to measure performance, mm. right? And so that's how we are setting up first with just the bonus plan, like and that. then that will go into ownership, and then I can decide, you know, do I want to keep fifty one percent for my family members? You know, I have nieces and nephews. I have a nephew who just graduated from architecture school. So maybe it's not my kids, but maybe it's a relative yeah. who's in the industry who's interested in, you and know. still having, carries the same last name. And, well, and still yeah, I don't even carry the name anymore. I'm, my last name is Daniel. So well, true. <laughs> <laughs> true. That's why I made both of my kids' middle names McKissick. Because mm. I wanted them to carry the name. And, you know, you. I thought I was raising my kids to be, you know, successors to my business. However, they grew up with the cell phone and the internet has more influence with, on my kids than I do. Absolutely. Mine's too. Right? That's, it's, that's I used to think, their phones all day long. I, I, I should have been saying, you know, you know what? Time out on that phone. Yeah. But I didn't think that. I thought they would see me working hard, that they would see the success that comes from that and, you know, more of, watching me to understand what they should do as adults. I got that wrong. Mm. They were watching the internet and what they, what happens on the internet and, you know, get rich quick, be a movie star. Um, I started taking my daughter out to both of my daughters to the BET awards um, many years ago. And that started her love for LA. Mm. I created it. You, you created that monster, <laughs> yes, huh? Yeah, the stars. Oh, the stars. The stars and the palm trees and the weather. Yeah, right. Yeah, that'll have you going. I mean, yeah, we get out there and I'd say, well, these are struggling stars. You know, like, I, that's fine. I understand you want to, you know, take a picture with them, but don't let that get into your soul. Absolutely. Everybody can't be a star. Everybody can't be a basketball, professional basketball player, you know, and everybody doesn't have the legacy like you. You're a unicorn. Absolutely. Not everybody has this generational They're wealth. It. They're getting it. They're getting now it. Now they start. How, how old are your daughters? <laughs> 26 and 27, but they are one year apart. They're both born in November. Mm. So they're both turning another year, 20, 28 and 27. And now they this get it. This month. And now they get it. Well, well, yes. Now they get it. Now That's they're beautiful. getting it. Yeah. So let's talk, let's talk profits, right? Because I always wanted to know this from a, you're doing a lot of big projects. Yeah. You know, all over New York City and all over the world. Can yeah. you name some of the projects before I ask my question? So that way you know. Sure. Uh, most of my large projects um, are here in New York. I mean, New York is the biggest, con largest construction market in the world. Even during COVID, you know, it was close to 30 billion a year in construction. <laughs> You know, now we're going to get closer to 50 billion. Um, just your projects. No, no. New or, York. Just, or just New York, period. New York. Oh, I'm about New York to say. City and I knew I smelled wealth when you walk in. <laughs> you walked in here. <laughs> so 50 billion just in New York, period. 
yeah, this market is just so big that um, I closed all of my mother's offices down in the South and just concentrated here. Okay. Because the saying is true. If you can make it here. You can make it anywhere. You can make New it York anywhere. New York is the Mecca. New York is the Mecca. And so um, we've had, New York received us well. And I think about this often because we came here with five generations and a repertoire of business across the South. I think about other companies that are construction companies who start from scratch mm -hmm. and how hard it was for us. I'm like, it must be doubly hard for, you know, a black person to start a construction company and, and start trying to get their first project. It mm -hmm. was, it was extremely hard. What were some of the difficulties that you faced coming in New York? With in construction, especially as a woman-owned company. So here's what happens to us. When um, clients look at people of color in their company, they go down a checklist and they say, have you done an auditorium before? Have you done a school before? Have you done restoration before? So that's the disqualifier. A white firm can walk in and instead of them looking at what they can't do, they look at what, what their potential do. is mm. and what they can do. Mm. So you can't even put your finger on something like that. And, and so you're just disqualified because you've never done it. Well, how are you going to do it if you don't get a chance to do it? Absolutely. If you don't give me the opportunity. If you don't give us an opportunity, how, how are you going to get a chance to do it? Um, we are doing the trading floors for J.P. Morgan Chase at their new building at 270 Park. Wow. We had never worked for any of the investment banks in all these years, even though we've tried. Have you ever done it? No, we're not interested. It's the same old, same old. They know all the contractors they want to work with. They don't want to diversify. They don't have to. It's like the white boys club, basically. I was going to say the boys club, but we're going to call it the white boys club because that's basically what it is. And then George Floyd, mm. right? Mm. They decide now it's time. It's time for diversity. Right. And so, you know, Jamie Dimon came out with a big charge and and he really means it. And, you know, now is disseminating through the ranks because that's another thing. Like the leader can meet it. Absolutely. We can have a, a governor that means it. But if her staff doesn't get it and they're still hiring the same people they've always hired, nothing changes. Nothing changes at all. Everybody at, at the, from the top to the bottom have to be on the same page. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, that now has opened the door for us to not only work at J.P. Morgan Chase, but now we're getting calls from Morgan Stanley, from Goldman Sachs. I mean, and so that's how it works. But someone has to open that door. Mm. And a lot of times that doesn't happen for us. Wow. So what we do at McKissick, and this is why our minority women-owned businesses, and let me focus in on minority, businesses that are owned by people of color, we have the highest number of any contractor in the city. Because when we, when we meet with contractors, we look at them as what their potential is. We're not, oh, well, you've never done this. You've never done that. Well, you did a floor. You, you, you laid the floor at Target. Yeah. So you can lay the floor at this museum. Absolutely. It's the so same what if you never did a museum? It's the same thing. Yeah. It's nothing different. Hello? <laughs> it's, the um, floor. <laughs> it's the same floor. It's the same floor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a, a value system that, you know, it's so, it's so subjective and in and, and, and the subconscious that we don't even recognize that it's there. Um, I am the chair of the New York Building Foundation and the New York Building Congress is the largest association around uh, real estate construction design. After George Floyd, of course, we put in place a diversity committee. And one of the things we did is one of the architectural firms came to the table and said, we did blind uh, resumes for our interns this year. We took off their name, where they lived, and guess what? We found out we had 30% more people of color hired as interns at our firm. That's incredible. Because when you read the name Letitia, yeah. or you see the address that's in the Bronx, 
Um, you're passing judgment. You're passing judgment, whether you know it or not. Yeah, so if you're looking at their accolades, their credentials, then you hire them on their merits. That's not right. Not where they're from. Not where they're from. So I think that's that's a huge win. That's a huge win. And hopefully it keeps going that way. Yeah. More companies should do that. More com and we're encouraging that. Um, but it's sad we have to do it uh, anyway, right? No, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. It's, it's a hurdle that we all face as black and brown people. Yes. That we don't get our fair shake. No. Um, and it's, we have to kick and scream to get what's really old to us. Right. If you really look at it. But it's unfortunate, but it's the world that we live in. And we, right. have, we have to adjust to it accordingly. And that's why it's important that we own our own businesses. Yep. And with ownership and entrepreneurship, we're able to hire who we want to hire. So let's speak about that because I know you're really big on entrepreneurship and especially black mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurship. And you have a company that's dedicated to helping entrepreneurs launch their own company. Let's talk a little bit about that before we get into all the projects. Okay, yes. I, what you're saying is so true. It's an ecosystem. Uh -huh. You know, we tend to hire uh, more people of color. Um, and and as a result of that, we're affecting communities, right? And so um, entrepreneurship is something I'm very passionate about. And one uh, company in particular that we've invested in and have ownership in is Legacy Engineering. Okay. A good friend of mine, um, he was a managing partner at one of the large uh, white firms, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, design firms here in New York. Um, and he retired. And his passion was also to build a engineering firm where we could turn our ownership over to people of color. Mm. So we, we uh, incorporated in 2019 Legacy, the two of us. And, you know, since then, we probably have about 15 employees. Um, our lead uh, managers are of color. They're engineers. You know, they're architects. They are. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and we are teaching them how to be owners. So from the very beginning, uh, we hired a coach and we began to outline what does ownership mean? How, how do you achieve ownership and, and how do you create a culture among people that never thought that they would own a, wow. a company? Because it's, it's a mentality thing. I mean, how many times have we heard the story about the black contractor who got a million dollar check for the first time yeah. and went and spent it, spent on, it all. <laughs> yeah, on foolishness. And the next thing you know, he can't pay the unions, yep. can't pay his subs, and he's out of business. Or robbing the next person for, for the job yes. and paying back the old people. It, yes. That happens all the time. It's so easy. So you can obtain money, but can you maintain mm. money? Very important. And very important. So that's, you know, someone wins the lotto and, and you scratch your head like, how did they end up in poverty? <laughs> but we see this all the time. Because there's no financial management, no it's, financial discipline. You know, discipline is very key. And I right. love what your company is doing. Is so you're, you're giving them all the tools and right. everything that they need to not just go out here on their own and just wing it, so to speak. Right. Like you're giving them training wheels. Training. Right. Yeah. Like. Financial is one part of it. The other part is building relationships. How do you, you know, how do you uh, actually become a true professional and represent your company as an owner? Because there are some do's and don'ts. Absolutely. <laughs> and a lot of us, look, because school can only teach you so much. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you have the right mentorship, the right leadership around you, the right people around you who's doing exactly what you want to do. Right. That can you know, cut your learning curve in half. Exactly. And help you excel to the next level. So I commend you guys for, you know, building a company mm -hmm. and a platform, so to speak, to help young entrepreneurs get mm -hmm. themselves in the game, but also be able to maintain for the long run so that way they can create right. that generational wealth. Because that's key. It's like home ownership. I tell people all the time, it's easy for the bank to approve you for a house. Well, you miss a payment, they're going to foreclose on you. <laughs> Exactly. Right? They're going to come get that, that house from you because you're not paying back that loan. So you have to be responsible and you have to have maturity. And I mm -hmm. think oftentimes when people want to buy real estate or start businesses, they lack the, a certain amount of maturity. Yes. First things first and the right mindset to go out here and own real estate and own businesses because people just want to get rich quick. 
and they think if you start a business or you buy real estate, I'm going to get rich. No, right. it doesn't work like that. No. You can get rich today, but you can lose those riches as quick as you got them. That's right. So I think it's very important what you guys are doing. Now, are you guys going to bring in more people into this firm? To, oh, to, yeah. You have oh, yeah. We're right hiring now. right now as we mm -hmm. speak. Because um, the thing is, there aren't that many black or Hispanic owned mechanical electrical plumbing design firms in New York. So, you know, people are, you know, knocking at our door trying to get us on their projects because, you know, they need to either cover, you know, for the MWBE, get the points for MWBE, or their client feels like that's what they want to see as much minority participation on the job. Or the architect themselves are saying this is the right thing to do mm. to hire a firm of color to do all of our engineering. Um, so if you think about it, it's been three years and, you know, we've grown substantially. We've gone from, you know, investing to a profit. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's always good in that's, only three years. In only three years. That's amazing. Right. Congratulations. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say is, you know, we talked about financial and we talked about culture and we talked about how, what are the do's or don'ts of being an owner the other thing we're doing is turning over our relationships. Okay. Because you know it's who no you know. No one does that. You know it's who you <laughs> no know. One, no one's no going one to take that. that to the grave. No, no, yeah. But no, they have to have, they have to understand how to develop relationships the way we have. And I think relationships are so key in building a successful business. Absolutely. Because it's always someone who helps you win that contract or selects you for that contract or implements that contract. Absolutely. So it's it's all about people. Relationships are greater than money. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. that's the most valuable asset that we all have. And it I is. think sometimes people chase money so much. No, you need to chase relationships. Exactly. Because if you get into the right rooms and you have the right relationships, the money will follow it. My father would say that all the time. It's mm. easy to make it. It's, it's easy, easy to, to make, make the money. It's going to come. It's going to come. Don't worry about the money. Just do what you need to do today. And do what you say you're going to do for the people. Whatever mm -hmm. you say to somebody, actually do it. Mm -hmm. Over deliver. Don't under deliver. And that's how you keep those relationships going. You add value to them. And then in turn, they're going to make you more money at the end of the day. Exactly. Because they're going to recommend you because of your integrity. Absolutely. Very yeah. important. Very important. Most important lesson of business, have integrity. <laughs> <laughs> have integrity. Don't be a scumbag. So my pastor is A.R. Bernard at okay. CCC. Yes, yes. He has a saying. He says, I do what I have to do so I can do what I want to do, do when I want to do it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's true. That was a it's Jesus true. gem. <laughs> that was a, a, a Jesus, Jesus A Jesus gem from the pastor. Because uh -huh. that's true. Right? Uh -huh. If you do right, everything will come back to you tenfold. Yeah. I want to ask you about the, um, you said the MWBE, correct? Minority Women Owned Business. Can you explain that for our audience, for fo folks who don't know what that is? Sure. And the benefit of it? Um, so it's a government program where uh, businesses that are owned by uh, people of color or women can actually get certified by, by uh, the city, by the state, or many agencies that are out there. And once you're certified as a minority company, then all contracts have a minority and women-owned business goal. Meaning if a contract is $20 million, the agency may say, we want 30% of that to go to MWBEs. So you will go on a team probably with a larger uh, contractor okay. or business and you would represent that 30% MWBE. And you are a subcontractor a lot of times. Okay. But it's a good program from the standpoint of when it started over 30 years ago in New York City, and I was just entering New York City at that time. I would be a sub to larger contractors, and that's what taught me how to work with my clients. Mm. It taught me, you know, what being a contractor in New York really was all about before I had to go out and do it on my own. And to me, that's what these programs are for. They're for really people that want to grow um, because you want to get that experience as a sub and then you want to make your way to being the prime contractor. 
So that was pretty much my strategy. You know, let me work with three good clients. Let it be the New York City School Construction Authority. Let it be the Dormitory Authority, which is the state of New York. Or, and let it be, you know, Health and Hospital Corporation, say. And I just only work for those clients. Wow. Till I got their whole mechanism down. And then I began to start going after that work as a prime. So this program essentially helped you to become the woman in the company that you are today, that we all see. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Absolutely. So but you, you have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got to make the decision. Because I know there's some sacrifices that comes with doing, being yes. a part of these programs. What are some of the sacrifices that you had to make um, being a part of this program? Well, um, some of the sacrifices is you're labeled as a minority women-owned business. And a lot of times people see that as your services are less, you know. There's this big myth that MWBEs cost more, which I never understood. Because we don't, you know, we when you're starting off, you don't have like a big office. So you don't have big overhead expense that you need to pass on to a client. Um, it's just really a myth. Um, except when it comes to construction, you know, there's the economy of scale. If you're if you're a large contractor and, and you're doing the electrical work on, you know, $200 million, mm -hmm. you're getting better rates Absolutely. on your equipment. Absolutely. You're getting uh, better uh, bonding uh, numbers from your uh, broker. So, you know, there's an economy of scales that does come into play. Um, but MWBEs have to grow to, to that level. Um, so those are some of the challenges you deal with. Uh, but for me, I always knew I wasn't going to be in that position long. Okay. I knew I was going to use that to go out and get my own contracts. So you have to be willing to make the decision not to take the most comfortable, easy route, but take the growth route. Mm. Don't, you know, don't let fear stop you. I call it paralyzed. <laughs> paralysis <laughs> by analysis. You've heard of that, yeah, right? Analysis paralysis. <laughs> I say that all the time. Yeah, right. You got to move. Yeah. You know, when the opportunity hits and there's a, for us, if there was a project that came out that was within the realm of us being able to do it by ourselves without a larger partner, we were going we after it. it. Yeah. And we knew we weren't going to win it. But the client was at this point now was going to see our qualifications. Absolutely. Because of the Us, program put you right. in this position to be subs. Of, exactly. Now that builds up your resume. That's right. That's right. That's Smart. right. Smart. So it's it's using that program. And I, I think the programs are great. And in New York City, we're way ahead of any other city that we work in. Um, you know, there's just a consciousness here. Like the standard now is 30 percent. It probably will get up to 50 percent at some point. That's incredible. That's incredible. So would you recommend, you know, anybody to go get this certification to be a part of this organization to so that way they can kind of follow in your footsteps as well? I recommend the MWBE certification to every business owner. And it's it's tedious. I mean, and they know everything about you. They mm. get your taxes, you know. Everything. They, <laughs> they want your blood type. Or your birth certificate. <laughs> you know, who you're children are your you know everything everything they get your financials on your business i mean everything is in so this have one you have, place. have your ducks in a row have your ducks in a row have your bookkeeping done have your taxes done properly oh yes you know have everything organized so that way when they ask for it you have it readily available that way they can have it correct right well and you can't work for the city of new york without having any of that mm. i mean you have to they have something called vindex where they check out thoroughly every vendor that works for the city and state of New York. Um, I haven't seen anything that rigorous anywhere. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, you have to have your ducks in a row. Okay, so let's fast forward. You've done some major projects here in New York. I mean, you've worked on LaGuardia Airport, JFK Airport, the Barclays, Harlem Hospital, Coney Island Hospital, the MTA system. Wow. <laughs> This is not small <laughs> projects, ladies and gentlemen. No. This, this is like the good. staple of New York City, all these projects. And, and your firm 
has essentially built these projects. Mm -hmm. This was all because of relationships I'm taking. Because, I mean, I can't see just any Joe Blow Schmo walking off the street and saying, hey, I want to go ahead and and help build the Barclays. Like, how did you go about securing these projects? Um, Well, it's not overnight. (laughs) It's a confluence of, of, of things that come together at one time to propel you to the next level. Um, And so if I look at the MTA, we are what's called the independent engineer, and we oversee the entire capital program. We have been doing that for 14 years. Wow. So the first- Sounds like a big budget. uh, 14 year project. 14 year. Well, the the first, uh, well, they have a new capital plan every three to five years, I want to say. And our first capital plan was around $30 billion. The current capital Hold plan on. is- You said $30 billion would have been? <laughs> would have been. Jesus. And what we do is we perform what I call operational audits on any project over $100 million, which is all of them. <laughs> that was a light flex, y'all. <laughs> Just a light stunt on y'all. All the projects over $100 million. We touch about 400 projects every year. Well, hold on. And every project's over a hundred million? Well, yes. Mm-hmm. Most of them. And we um, <laughs> we review them respect, re- with respect to schedule, scope, and if there's any troubleshooting that needs to be done, and we report into the board on, on what our opinion is on all these projects. Wow. And so our first contract, we had a large company named Delcan, which was an international company, and we joint ventured with them. So it was Delcan and McKissick. McKissick probably had 35% and Delcan probably had 65% of the contract. In the middle of that contract, Delcan was bought out. Really? By um, a company called Parsons. And Parsons well, couldn't work at the MTA. So Delcan had to, to relinquish the contract and give it all to us. And that's how we became... <laughs> <laughs> Prime on that contract. Everything happens in God's time. <laughs> you know, it stars align. That's yep. why I said it's a confluence of things. And then now we're competing again because the contract's every seven years. But we we had been the Prime now for three years. Yeah. So we compete again and we win again. I mean, we carry the MWBE pro, um, points uh, for the capital um office at the MTA because it's such a, a large project contract. Yeah. Right. Um, so now um, it's, it's up for a recompete again and we're taking a different position this time around. Um, we're going to go in as a sub and, and eventually just work on the other side um, where we can actually do construction management projects um, and probably have a bigger impact at the MTA but because we had this oversight position, we have all the experience, we have the resume, we have the people. You have everything you need. And so now, you know, we've built a company that the MTA, that we're, we're a trusted partner with yeah, the MTA. Yeah, I was MTA. just about to say that. They know who you are. But look, it's been 14 years. Mm. This is not an overnight uh, success story. Mm. <laughs> My mom likes to say it's taken us 100 years to become an overnight success. No, I mean, look, fifth generation. <laughs> yeah, right. And there's been trials and tribulation with every generation. Absolutely. And now you've been, you're leading this to the promised land. So your yep. daughter's now going to come in here and, and take this to the, a whole nother level. I'm praying for that. <laughs> this is, this is, I mean, this is incredible. Yeah. This no. is an incredible story. So let's talk about the Affirmation Tower. Okay. You know, that's another big project that um, you, the Craig Levinson and Don Peoples, are trying to get done here in New York. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that project? Sure. So um, the Empire State that owns Javits has a piece of property that they um, put an RFP out for a developer. What's an RFP? Um, <laughs> request for a proposal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they want developers to come in and develop this piece of property. Now, I got a call uh, from, um, oh gosh, um, not JLL, but one of the l- large real estate brokers. You know what? You know the real estate brokers, mm-hmm. um, CBRE. And they Huge. said, we're looking at this. We want to go after this, but we think this job is perfect for Don Peoples. 
Mm. So, so they called you initially. They called, yes, yeah, CBRE okay. called me. We do some work with them, and uh, I'm like, well, I know Don. I've been knowing Don for God no, I I can't even tell you how long. <laughs> and I called Don, and he was looking at the project. I'm like, CBRE wants to team with you on this project. He's like, wow, that's great. Um, now you know who they are. Yeah, like these huge. are the brightest. The, they understand Absolutely. trends. They know, you know, development in the future, what that's going to look like. Now, if they think Don Peoples is the right person for this, what, what's wrong with the state of New York? Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> a whole nother story. I have to shake my head. <laughs> that's a whole nother story. I have to shake my head. Politicians. I mean, can you imagine if people were talking about that black tower right now? They come out and vote. Vote. <laughs> in droves. In droves right now. Right? They kind of dropped the ball. Like it's, uh, I mean, you know, I, I kind of, I understand it, but we, I feel like we could be in a much better place. Uh, so Don, um, I have completed projects with Don. He's the only black developer that's done a project downtown on, on Leonard street. It's a condo building. It's absolutely beautiful. It's first class. And, and that's what he and his wife do. They do first class, everything. So Don brought in David Ajay as the architect, uh -huh. and David Ajay is world renowned, um, and he did an amazing design. And Don decided let's let's build the tallest building we can, and it's not over the Freedom Tower, just below it, but let's make it right there. Design is beautiful. It looks like an inverted uh, building, and, nah, and that's that's for a reason. Um, it's three and a half billion dollars. We committing, we're committing uh, thirty five percent to uh, minority women owned and service disabled veterans. Wow! So that's over a billion dollars. It will house the NAACP, and we're very close to getting out Sharpton's museum there. Wow! Um, and so this is something that has to happen. This is historic. But let me tell you the most the brilliant piece about this project. So, you know, Wall Street is interested in ESG, mm -hmm. environmental, social, and governance. And Wall Street's all about investing in companies that can uh, rack up points in those areas. So, you know, working with diverse companies, you know, what's the governance of your board? Do you have, you know, minorities and women on your board? Those, those type of things. So the banks and anywhere, any other company that's trying to rack up ESG points, if they rent in our building, those are huge points. Those are huge points. Because yeah. it's owned by a black developer. Um, and so when we were in the presentation, they're like, well, there's so much, you know, office space and, you know, who's going to rent from you? Everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. Because they want those points. It's, it's class A <laughs> yes. space. Yeah. And they want the points. And they want the points. Yeah. But this is, this is a movement now. This is not just about the bricks and mortar of a tower. This is a movement for people of color and for the city and state of New York to say we are open for business for everybody. Absolutely. Not just a few. We're open for everyone. This was not a trend nationwide. We have other cities calling us, asking us to build Affirmation Tower in their city. Wow. But we want to build it. In the Mecca. You ha got it. It has to be in the Mecca. Over 300 skyscrapers, not one built by a black developer. No damn sense. No damn sense. And listen, I just want to tell your audience, black people can work together. That's a fact. That's a fact. That is a big fact. And Don is a developer. I'm a contractor. Craig's a developer, but Don says, Cheryl, on this one, you're going to be a developer with me. Mm. So he's bringing me into his business. I'm working on the construction for his, for a uh, people's corporation. Craig Livingston is another developer. He brought him in. Don didn't have to do that. Absolutely. He could have done it all on his own. And that's collaboration. Collaboration is greater than competition. Yes. And people try and tell us we can't work together, but we can. Absolutely. And that sets, that sets an example for all of us. Yeah. Right? When we have folks like yourself at this level, right? You guys, all three of y'all at the highest level in real estate in yeah. our community.
to see you guys come together. That means everyone below you can come together and right. we all can grow and build skyscrapers at right. some point in our careers too. Because if you guys can do it, we can do it too. Absolutely. But this one, I mean, just think about it. It's 2022. <laughs> and we can't, and we, we were buying it at market rate. We weren't asking for tax credits. None of that. And we can't get that. And so why you know, do you think the governor's office is kind of stopping you guys from moving forward with these plans? Um, well, uh, the governor's office said they want to have, see affordable housing. Um, and so I'll, we can take her at her word on that. I get that. But also, you know, there's always politics at play. Um, so I think Affirmation Tower comes back into play once the governor and Kathy Hochul um, secures her role mm. as governor, then it comes back into play. Um, but I hope that there is an understanding that there needs to be an economic shift for people of color. And I specifically mean black people. Um, we have been black yes, people. Yeah. We have too been many economically times they throw oppressed. They throw minority around. Right. right. No, I want things for black people. This is black people. Yeah, because when you we had built all these this rep, country, we built this country, and then you made laws to stop us from gaining wealth and real estate. Right. Specifically, black people, not minorities, black people. Right. So I want to see things for black people. We need that. Yes, and I believe Kathy Hochul gets that. I do. You know, but I also know if this tower were going up, or if there was a designation right now to a what I want to call, uh, well, it's a black development, but I call it the Black Tower. The Black Tower. I like that. <laughs> the Black Tower. I like that. In all the boroughs, black people would be coming out everywhere because they'd have a reason. They'd Absolutely. be energized. Absolutely. Because they see real change happening right, right. before their eyes. They right. see real development That's happening. opening a door. A big door. Real estate in New York, that's opening a door. This is one of the toughest places to be in the real estate business. In, right. Because right. it's dominated by white people. Right. Right. Black right. people get put into this box. Yeah. There, on all levels. Construction, whether you're doing transactional business as a realtor, broker, mortgages. But right. all in one box. Like, we all know each other. It's, you know, and we, we have so much more potential, but we just don't get... We don't get those opportunities. We like, don't. When we see those million dollar listings in Manhattan and in Brooklyn, you don't never see no black listing agents. No. You see the same usual suspects, you know, listing them. And it's black people that are, and black women that are very qualified to represent these sellers and these transactions. So we just need the opportunities. And, and, and they have the opportunity smart. to give you the opportunity right here with, this, the, with the black tower. Right. Wouldn't that be like. <laughs> that would be mind blowing. Every, that would be national. News. That would be global news. Exactly. Global exactly. News. Can you imagine? That would be incredible. Anyway, I mean, we <laughs> hope it happens and hope it happens soon. Let's hope so. What I can think, we do to help this well, happen? Don't let it die. I mean, we keep we keep Affirmation Tower out there. You know, we're on social media. Come follow us. Um, you know, we want to keep this movement going because it's not just about this building. It's about breaking through economic oppression that we've lived through for years mm. and and politicians taking the black vote for granted. Um, and we're smart about that now. Absolutely. We're getting smarter and smarter every day. The worst thing we can do is, to them is to say, OK, we're just not even coming out. OK, because I'm, there's no reason. There's no reason. There's, there's no, no benefit. Reason. There's no benefit. I don't for care us. if you're a Democrat, Republican, independent. Look at the candidate and see what they're doing for our community. Absolutely. We're tired yeah. of the talk. Yeah. We're tired of the, the, the campaign it's trail. It. It's annoying now. Yeah. It's like we Turkeys vote for you. Turkeys Christmas. Absolutely. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a turkey. <laughs> no. We don't know the turkey. We're sick of your turkeys. We're sick of your turkeys. We've been eating turkeys for decades. Right. Guess what? We're vegan now. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all hear that? We're vegan now. We're vegan now. <laughs> <laughs> we we want some economic you know equality. Yes, I love that. <laughs> We're vegan. <laughs> You're hilarious. No, we care we care about our bodies too. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> we're healthy. Oh, man. We're I'm married to a doctor who's a GI doctor. So <laughs> I love that. You know what? <laughs> Before we go, because I know we're running on time and you're a very busy woman, but I wanted to ask you about this, right? Um, and we were spoke about this off camera, sacrifice to be this successful. You know, you're married, you have children, you know, you've been running around the world doing interviews and meetings and galas and everything all over the world. Like success comes with sacrifice. And I yeah. don't think people really understand that. Like, how do you balance all of this? Like the pressure of running, running a fifth generation company, being a mom, being a wife, being a boss. Like, how do you balance all of this? I don't know. I don't know if I'd be good. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be good. You know, my motto is I just try for 90%. I'm not trying for 100 because mm. 90 is still an A. And <laughs> so, you know, if, if, if I could be a 90% good mom, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm, I don't need to be 100. I love that. Um, I, and it's interesting you say that because my kids were out in Westchester. My company's here in Manhattan. I couldn't get home to pick them up from school. They stranded. I mean, it was all kind of stuff, you know, taking them to whatever sports they wanted to do or after school. I couldn't do that. Um, and so I missed a lot of that. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if it has an effect now. But, you know, they like the cheese, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love they just, it. They're going to have to forgive me. Yeah, <laughs> they have no choice. They're going to forgive me. <laughs> because, I mean, look, you got an A. It's right, 90%. You gotta so you're good. Yes. Now, my husband is my partner. Um, you know, he, he has taught me a lot about business. He used to run North General Hospital, so mm -hmm. he was not only a doctor he was a businessman he had mcdonald's he the ihops in harlem wow um and so he's been uh, a very strong partner for me uh especially when i'm talking about how to deal with men which is what i have to do every single day um and he would say you know don't you run up to anybody else in life <laughs> Let them come to you. I, come I was like, well, well, what's that mean? They're not going to know who I <laughs> He's like, uh-uh. Let, let your work speak for itself. And then they come to you. And let them come to you. And, you know, I didn't get it first, but I got it now. And I'm like, just settled in who I am. But it, it took a while. I mean, in, in my 30s, in my 40s, it was just like hustle and bustle. Just get it done. You know, insecurities, um, scared to go into the room. I'm the only black female among all the white men. You know, what I say, are they going to care? You know, they talking over, you know, the New York way. Yeah. And, you know, but now I'm at the point like, hold it. Yeah. <laughs> now you, you assert yourself now. I have now. something to say. Absolutely. Because you're a boss. I'm a boss. Yeah. Right. You know, I've been looked over. I've been, you know. I've had disappointing moments where, you know, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. I've heard hearsay. It's we're not ready for a black woman to do this now. And, you know, how do you how do you overcome all of that? And I've had just good advice from my husband and a couple of others, you know, to say, was I even considered for that job? Was I even, mm. did my name even come up? So it's not like tooting your own horn, yeah. but it's throwing your hat in the ring. Absolutely. Dusting it off, just dusting off all the shade. <laughs> I know you get a lot of shade. Just dust off the shade and just keep forging ahead, being comfortable in your own shoes. Um, and now I do a lot of meditation. I will just sit down, turn on calm. <laughs> Get back center and go back at it. You got to have a Wusa moment, huh? Yeah. Yes, yes. Because it's always coming. Yeah. It's always coming. Life is always going to throw you lemon. Yeah. You got to make lemonade out of it. But that's the beauty of it. Absolutely. That's how you build integrity. Absolutely. And that's how you build your perseverance. And that's how you build your company. And that's how you win. And that's how term. you win. Absolutely. And now all I do is win. Talk win. your talk. <laughs> all you do is win. <laughs> Yo, I can't even. Look, I, we can end it on that one. Because <laughs> all you do is win. Wow. I love I love you. You're incredible. Oh, thank you. Like, thank I you. truly honestly mean, I was looking forward to this conversation at Invest Fest, but I'm happy it, it happened here because I didn't have 14,000 people to, like, distract me. Yeah. You're incredible. Oh, and, thank I, you. and I pray that you guys get everything that you, you want out of life. And I hope this affirmation tower 
definitely happens because we need the black the black skyscraper. We need we, the we, black skyscraper. We 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 need that, and I love to just see women in real estate just thriving and striving and winning at a very high level. So you. you inspired me today. So thank you. thank you. How how can our people keep up with you? Tell them how to find you. Um. Uh, well. Um. On Instagram, Facebook. You know, all of social media. And that's a good place to reach out to me. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. This was another incredible episode. Again, thank you so much for your time today. Okay. I, I could talk to you for a whole nother hour, <laughs> but I know you got other things to do. Let's go to dinner. <laughs> Let's definitely dinner on me. Let's <laughs> dinner on you. You're wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> dinner on me. <laughs> Hold on. I'm tired of paying for dinners. I got so much more money around me. <laughs> you can pay, but no, definitely dinner. I would love that to continue to pick your brain. But you guys tap in with this episode. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Send this to everybody that you know make sure you download it on audio um i'm full right now this was incredible matt garland nmls number 58700 better known as mg the mortgage guy peace <laughs>